Hey guys, this is Document One, and we're going to give you a track breakdown of our latest single, Hands Up, out on Elevate Records. Let's dive in and have a look. So, um, yeah, this is the project uh, for our new track, Hands Up, uh, out on Elevate. Um, this is what you see when you open a track at this kind of stage by us, you know, nearing completion. Uh, you've basically got pretty much four channels, drums, bass, music, effects. That's the essence of a drum and bass tune in our world. Um, the other tracks that you can see are intro bass, a few of the, the main basses copied across um, that just filter up, they build into the drop over here. Um, the reason we put them on a separate channel is just to avoid any side chaining, anything that reacts to the drums, basically. Um, so when the kicks and snares are building towards the drop, you don't get a load of um, kind of pumping in that bass. So yeah, you can just consider that more bass. Uh, and then the final one is our reference track, which is here. In this instance, we're using a Fade Black tune. We usually have a couple of different references. Uh, we love Fade Black, big up to them. Um, our reference channel is muted, you can see here. When we press what we've key mapped to S, uh, it solos that track. And then um, on our master, which is just a Pro-L, just for a bit of limiting, uh, it, that's bypassed. Uh, we've grouped it, so sometimes we'd have a bit more um, going on there. Uh, maybe an EQ or some stereo. Um, but all that means is when we uh, solo our reference track, we get the full track at full vo volume, post mix down, post mastering, and we have an opportunity to compare our tune uh, with that uh, when it's being limited. Little indication of how the tune will react to limiting at the mastering stage. Um, and it just gives us a, a sort of chance to hear our tune at full level um, and we can export it like that for club use as well uh, so yeah basically within these groups we've got loads of channels but the sort of tune looks like this basically um, yeah, yeah so I think we'll start with the music uh, group which we've got here music elements uh, for this track particularly were started uh, with a vocal uh, this project came from Joe. He sort of uh, came up with the idea, the original sort of sketch for the track. And it had this vocal, um, which we'll quickly play you, um, which sounds a bit like this. Uh, if I start back at the beginning instead of starting halfway through. Jump, throw them hands up. 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 Okay, so that goes round and round and round. That's kind of the intro. It's kind of building sort of uh, part of the tune. And it gets it gets you going from, from the off-go. So it's kind of like... Uh, it's accompanied along with this synth, uh, which again was in the original sketch that Joe came with, uh, which originally was found from a um, an analogs patch. So analogs lapse is a VST which is made by Arturia, and it's kind of got a whole bunch of old vintage uh, synthesizers that you can sort of delve into if you're lacking a bit of inspiration or you just want to kind of get something a bit musical going. So this, yeah, analog lab is like our inspiration machine it's yeah. really cool uh i think it might be free it certainly came free when we bought a piece of uh arturia hardware and it came with it but it it basically wraps up like thousands of presets across all of their modeled analog kind of classic simps all the things they've done from junos to uh you know mini moogs whatever and it bundles all of these presets into one list and you can narrow them down with their browser but it's like an aladdin's cave of of sort of synth presets from the vintage era and it's super cool um, yeah very inspiring and this track like i said it started with this kind of plucky driving um almost guitar chug uh sound which is a little bit like this so it's kind of phasey um but accompanied with the vocal, that kind of, it, it just gets it going from, from the offset. So we also doubled that up with, uh, one thing to mention is a serum, which we've actually flattened uh, to save on a bit of CPU at the time. And the serum patch wasn't, it wasn't like massively uh, complex or anything. It sounds a little bit like this. It was more, more or less filling out the frequency range. So it's kind of similar, 
but when you put it, uh, let's just solo that group, put them together, it sounds like that. So that accompanied with uh, our vocal, jump, throw them hands up, you get that. That's like literally it for the majority of the intro. Pretty much. Like quite a horrible kind of phasey old synth sound with, with uh, a vocal. Uh, kind of beaten time stretched vocal that sounds all weird and digital and artifacty. But it's cool. It creates some kind of it creates a vibe for for you know you know you know what's going to happen. You know the kind of track it might be that sort of you know creates tension. Doesn't yeah. it? That drone kind of chuggy drone um, and it gives the track some ID because uh, you've got some lyrics to listen to, to hear, to repeat. When you hear it in a DJ set, you've got something to cling on to and you look for that track, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's simple but effective. And one thing on the vocal side of things, like Joe said, we, we, this kind of time stretchy thing, one one thing we actually did do, if you check the uh, the processing down here, it's not... It's not crazy. We haven't used a lot of external effects or anything like that. We've just got some EQ. We've got the glue compressor, uh, some reverb filtering, that kind of stuff. And a lot of it is is automation that we've programmed to kind of come into the 16. So we've got a, an initial 16 to start the track off where the, the vocal's just doing its thing along with that chug uh, synth. And then when we get to bar 17 or 16, as you whatever you want to call it, it's uh, it breaks down to kind of build up for the, the main part of the track. Uh, the main drop so what we did in that case was we actually we used um just a stereo delay we took the uh the time feature we took it off a of sync so we actually had it into milliseconds and one thing we did with that was we automated the the uh the actual time the milliseconds the feedback and the wet dry so it was getting a kind of more i don't know it's almost like a grain delay kind of crazy effect uh building into this uh bar 17 here so if i play you a little snippet you'll understand what we what we mean if we just solo that. So that kind of fits nicely into into the it sort of rolls out nicely into the, the build up. And within that build up we've got um a vocal which we've pitched down um I think it's an octave and that's it's just again creating tension to go along with the um with the build up. So just sounds like that. Nothing crazy. Barely even sounds like the word jump. Yeah. After all that processing, but in the context of the tune, it works. It's it kind of sounds cool. Yeah, so. and that's that's just simple Ableton Overdrive, uh, a little bit of OTT uh, to kind of pick up all the kind of like sucks up every bit of the uh, of the sound that it can, um, and uh, it just you know obviously goes crazy with the compression. Uh, the only other thing we've got there is we've got an EQ just taking out some of the uh, some of the sort of mid range that we didn't really want, and again some of the super not super highs, but that sort of really harsh uh, sort of in the sort of maybe four four k five k that kind of region. And then one thing that we do love um, is this uh, Ableton amp uh, that, that made by Softube, which is it's part of the stock plugins that you get in Ableton. It's amazing. We use it on anything from vocals to bass to drums to whatever. If it sounds good, we'll we'll use it. So, I think Softube made the glue compressor as well, right? I think uh, maybe, maybe yeah. I think you could be right. Um, Softube is sick. We've got the console one by them and a few different plugins and yeah, they're yeah, amazing. Love them. Yeah, absolutely love it. So that that is a big part of this sound. One thing that this sound has is a is a sort of throw delay. So rather than do the automation on the main channel of that, we actually decided to copy the audio. And on this channel here, what you'll see is we've got a, um, got like a bandpass, um, like a I was sort of like notch, sorry, not a notch, band, bandpass filter, which is acting um, as the kind of the telephone effect, I guess you'd call it. Um, along with some real sort of uh, short delay and some reverb. So that on its own sounds a little bit like this. So it's kind of dubby. <laughs> yeah, kind of dub sort of effect, I guess. And then when you put it with the um, alongside the, the main one, it fills the space. So rather than it just being dead space while it's building up, you've got you've got a bit of ambience, a bit of sort of... Um, and it's just made by delay, really, I guess. It's it? a cool way to do... And the nice thing about filtering the feedback from a delay is that it doesn't get in the way of the original source. So when you've got something like this where the it's repeating, uh, 
when the delay underneath is repeating at a different speed and, and with a long tail, it don't get in the way, does it? No. Because you're just doing that tiny little band you've got around 1K or whatever. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. All I mean, mixed together. It all mixed together. Cool. Exactly. The, the last piece of the puzzle, something we do uh, on a few of our tracks is that with this jump vocal, it's it's building up, it's building up, and then just before the drop, we have the hook said one more time, but we've actually doubled that with a um, an octave below, and that's just been kind of totally destroyed with, again, uh, overdrive, OTT, and a bit of EQ. So nothing crazy, but it sounds barely recognizable to the word jump, throw your hands up or whatever. So it's, you know, it's ridiculous, but it adds a thickness... Um, to the vocal that you don't get when you're listening in the intro. So just, just right before that initial drop, it, you get that. So it kind of doubles it up and it adds, a, adds an extra layer to it. So something that we've been doing for a little while, um, just, to, just to add that little extra sparkle, I guess. Um, I think like the moral of the story with this intro is everything is, all the techniques are way more simple than what you might think when you're listening to the track. It, it kind of... You've got this energy coming in. You've got these vocals doing strange effects, sound kind of sci-fi, I don't know, futuristic, whatever. But when you look behind the curtain, we've got like a one vocal that's been pitch shifted with a load of overdrive on it, another vocal with some delay, and we're messing around basically with the delay time. Uh, and like, you know, some other little effects, another, another delay sort of bouncing off it using super kind of basic classic effects like this is what yeah. you see on like a Jimi hendrix record or something i don't know do you know yeah, what i it's mean very, it's like, very simple this this, is, we're not reinventing the wheel with this this stuff. is drum and bass but it's it's funny with these things like you create a vibe it, there's no need to overcomplicate things so when you hear the intro to this tune for instance basically what you hear is what we just went through like there's a few little sparkles and that and there's a couple of percussive instruments that add to the tension obviously you're going to get your kicks and your basses building up with that like joe mentioned at the, the beginning yeah. we've got a, a bass line that's being filled in these are things that are all creeping into again add that tension mm -hmm. so that when it gets to that drop you've got you've got more impact um but really like joe said the, the track isn't much more than that if, i mean if what's there is decent uh you don't need a lot like you don't need to throw loads in a tune and i think the same applies for like uh, your sound sources are so important if you're constantly trying to make your snare fat and the sound source itself the sample isn't great you're gonna really struggle yeah. if if you manage to get anywhere near what you're aiming for at all if you start from a place where it's a really good recording of a snare or in digital terms it's a really you know the fundamentals and the frequencies have to be there you you're going to really struggle to introduce those artifacts and those things so uh if they're not there to start with so yeah it's just really important to make sure that in a tune especially a drum and bass tune because it's so fast and so hectic that you don't put too much in it but what's there is cool or or at least good quality yeah uh, sonically yeah, yeah totally so I guess uh, with that being said, we should probably get onto the meat of the tune, which cool. is the drop. Um, and before we go into breaking down the drums or the bass, we'll play you a little snippet of what the drop sounds like, where all the elements are played together, and then we'll break it down further. Cool. I'll play it for now. Yeah, so uh, it's a fairly heavy drum and bass tune. It's not, um, yeah, it's nothing. It's not for the faint-hearted. Nah, exactly. It's heavy for us. <laughs> um, so yeah, shall I listen to the drums? Yeah, let's start with the drums. Let's open it up. So within the drum group itself, you're gonna find, uh, like normally we would have different layers. So we'll have percussive layers, we'll have percussive groups. Um, we and, and then we have the main kick and the snare. Yeah, so the first group you see within the drum group um so i mean to talk about groups every step of the way as you get up to the top group everything's being affected 
like you can apply effects to a group and it, and everything within that group will be affected you can make another group within there and any effects you apply to that group will just be what's in it. so you know any any effect i.e this compression here that's doing everything in our drum group but uh once i get to this first group this is just um you know doing what's inside that group i mean you'll see a lot of grouping going on in our tunes but it's um it's a great feature of of like modern day doors it's kind of like mix buses used to be back in the day and yeah. you only had a certain amount now we can go crazy with it but in this kick snare group we've obviously got um uh our standard ableton drum rack and that's literally got a kick and a snare they're really kind of um they're really kind of basic sounds but they very much hit the fundamentals so they're in tune with the the track they're literally in the key they basically hit the fundamentals this snare has a load of kind of i don't know what the what the frequency is probably around like two three hundred and then a load of sizzle at the top super highs um and then the kick lower down but the same thing applies it's it's almost like a I mean, it's not that far away from... A, it's probably a synthesized kick on, on Serum, for instance. Um, we tend to actually keep quite a bit of sub as well in our kicks, like more often than not. Like, mm -hmm. I think sometimes people get really bulked down in, you know, signing it off at kind of 80 to 100 hertz-ish, you know. But it, it's track dependent for us anyway it is. And it's like more often than not, we'll roll it down a little bit further. Obviously, you've got to be very conscious of the sub. And there's ways of getting the kick out of the way or mm -hmm. getting the sub out of the way, shall I say. Um, you know, you can use whether it's side chaining or volume automation or whatever it might be. But it, sometimes we find that if you if you don't keep that fat uh, sort of body to the to the actual kick drum, you, your track can sound a little bit light, you know. Yeah, totally. Um, and th this track just felt like we needed it more it's than anything. It's each to their own. And a lot of people keep it out the way of their bases and, and like Matty says, roll it off up a, a, a bit higher. But... We're old school. We like that weight to the kick. Yeah. When you're in a club and the system's hitting you, it's, it's that kick drum. Um, so, yeah. I mean, we have our fundamentals, kick and snare. They're really basic sounds. Um, and then we have a load more kind of frequencies and harmonics or whatever added by addictive drums. Um, so that gives it a more natural feel. And that's actually doing a... It's like a kick snare pattern. It's got a bit of a snare... Um, actually in there yeah. which has just been EQ'd out exactly so we've we've kind of rolled it all off so that it's just the mids and tops and that sits on top of our kick and snare to create um, a drum beat that sounds more live the cool thing about something like addictive drums is you get that natural stereo field of the overheads and you get um, that you know like you can add a bit more of the mic from the bottom of the snare it gives you kind of the the sizzle of the of the strings or whatever they're called yeah. i don't know the snare thingies um but it gives you that kind of room feeling you've got room mics you've got overheads you've got mm. stereo field you and you don't have to do anything it does it for you like you program a drum beat yeah you edit the pitches and all of that you get it right you get it sitting right with with your kicking snare but adds a whole load of stuff kind of natural, natural sound, natural sound. yeah i play them together and now you got like a drum beat that yeah okay it don't sound like a drummer playing a live beat but it's it's got that flavor and it also is down to the kind of fundamental frequencies of the kick and snare enough to be a digital drummer bass tune that it cuts through the other mm. other channels at the yeah. mix stage it's nice and easy so yeah, I mean, that's basically all the drums is. And then on top, we've got the, some more percussion. Yeah, there's a percussive group, which is made up of things like, I don't know, claps in the intro. We've got uh, a crash on, you know, start of each 16, really obvious things. But then we've we've filled out a couple of um, holes with extra uh, hi-hat loops and more importantly, a uh, like kind of a wide sounding uh, ride um yeah. yes. which is quite high which really is high yeah really high but just 
you know, it's pulsing. We've added a bit of the uh, Ableton utility width. We haven't gone crazy with it. It's just, it's there to add that sizzle and add to add that kind of extra flavor to it. So we've done that. And on top of it, we've actually, we've got a couple of other little uh, open hi-hats and, and just a get additional hats to kind of, you know, which are more synthesized, more, you know, they're a lot more uh, tight and they they don't have that kind of room vibe like Joe was explaining with addictive drums. So they're actually making it, I guess, a, a more filling in the overall picture of what we want our drums to sound like. So yeah. you have a live feel to it and it can sound like quite a big drum sound, but it, it's drum and bass at the end of the day. It's never going to be a, a totally live kit. It's going to have parts of it that are going to be synthetic. Yeah, it's exactly. It's like... Everything in there, again, it's not rocket science, it's bread and butter stuff. We got some brakes chopped out, some hats, like Matt was saying, uh, some of the audio, you know, loops, um, and we EQ them just to fit together. It's not a big deal. Uh, some ride, and then the addictive drums, which just adds that kind of sound, and then a really punchy kick and snare. I mean, when you mm. put it all together, it just makes, it's a nice little drum beat. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, the other bits, tracks that you can see, we got Ghost Bass. Shall I quickly go into this yeah, now? Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, ghost Bass and Ghost Hats. Basically, all this is, is it's rooted. So from the kick and snare channel, uh, we've got it rooted here for the input. It's a MIDI channel. Um, and that comes, yeah, so that comes in. We've got it set to in. And then I'll, this one, this basically a, a side chain trigger. Um, so the ghost bass comes in from the kick snare. So anytime we edit the kick and snare pattern, it's automatically, um, you know, following it. And then it goes out to our bass bus or bass group um, to a VST called Duck, um, which we really like. Um, and if I just quickly look at that, I'll open Duck. So Duck is triggered by that MIDI. Uh, it's basically a, a volume automation plugin. Every time the MIDI hits, um, it, it, we've got it set to go from uh, muted, basically, to fully open. And all that's doing is following this curve of volume automation, which is triggered every time uh, the kick and snare, kick or snare hit. Sometimes we do it with just the kick and we have another one for the snare. Sometimes in this, on this occasion, we did it more simply. You can choose your milliseconds, how quickly it reacts, the, the curve of, of the automation. But all this means is it's constantly following. It's nice and easy. It's, we find that it's, it's way more, there's way more control than sidechain compression. And all it's doing is ducking our bass uh, out the way of the um out the way of the the kick and snare or kick is the one that really matters um we got it set to super fast because it's such a tight beat mm. that the just the beginning of the transients need to be caught um and ducked out the way just to create room in the mix and make sure the kick and snare never get lost the other nice thing about this plugin is which we usually use but we haven't on this tune we're just ducking the whole thing there's a crossover so you can make it affect the lows more than the highs and you can choose where it what frequency it crosses yeah. over at and very cool little thing um, super useful we tend to prefer it to side chain compression for that more clinical m getting things out the way super so fast, that you don't get a huge build up of, of the same frequency so where the kick drum crosses over with the bases in terms of frequency. You can duck it out the way, quite literally duck it. So that's what those two channels are doing there. Um, for, this, for the kick, we basically got it going. I think we do both for both on this tune, but usually we'd have the kick going to the bass and the snare going to the hats, for example, because we've got um, a lot going on in the percussion channel that clashes with the frequency of the snare. It will trigger exactly the same way you can choose how your envelope, the envelope reacts to it and um, duck those out the way or, you know, um, and you get less phasing, you get less buildup of frequencies that clash. Um, so that's the drums. Yeah. Where are we Pretty now? Pretty much now. <laughs> I, think, I think the only thing really to, to, the final thing to talk about on drums is oh, maybe, within... Maybe the overall... The overall sort of, the, the groups, um, like the percussion groups, 
is, is again, there's a bit of automation going on, and duck is obviously a big part of that at the end. But we've got some additional saturation, and we've made... Saturation's good. Yeah, the it? Ableton saturator, we love that saturator. Mm. Um, it's a big, big part of our... Uh, sort of go to um, get things louder without or appearing louder without using limiting. Yeah, isn't it? it's, yeah, it's and it doesn't it doesn't smash things up too much. It's it's quite clean, I find. Mm. Uh, but then you know we've got a just a generic e uh, Ableton EQ8. The uh, the EQ is just rolling off, kind of just over a hundred. There's some ducking there for frequencies that probably have looking back probably annoyed us for some reason. Uh, and then just a tiny bit of shelving going at the top. And then we've put this. Um, We've got this glue compression going along and then just a couple of extra bits that like this filter is obviously doing uh, some build up stuff where we've we've chosen to um, automate it in that sense. But really, we we've we've done that to the group and we then feed that into an overall group of the drums, which is just tickling a little bit of, of compression, really. I don't think it's doing anything too crazy. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much the, it. The last thing that's worth mentioning while we're on the drums think it might be on here is this uh, isotope neutron, neutron um, transient designer or transient whatever transient transient shaper thing shaper yeah. uh, we love it because of the uh, <laughs> the kind of visual aspect of it it's got nice metering and everything uh, really easy controls, nice and basic, and most importantly, it's multiband. So here we're pushing the sustain super hard on this snare, uh, whereas we're pulling it back, adding a load of punch on everything else. I mean, sometimes we use three bands. But it just gives you so many shaping uh, possibilities or options for shaping sounds like drum hits where you want to really play with the transients uh, so much better to have uh, the multi-band option. So yeah, that's something we use a lot specifically for drums. It's super good, super good. Yeah, it massively makes a difference, doesn't it, as well? So it's, it's, yeah, it's... if I turn that off. It's crazy. It tightens everything awesome. up. Awesome. And it just gives that, that sustain on the high end, just gives that extra sizzle. So it's, yeah, yeah it's a really helpful tool, uh, mm. particularly with drums, I find. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's really good. I'm sure there's loads of multi-band transient designers out there, but um, we love that one. It's sick. Yeah, we're a big fan of the ozone stuff overall. I think isotope. Yeah, I isotope. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is is just it's um yeah, that's sick. It's amazing. So yeah, saying that, we'll move into the bass quick and we'll open that. It's a up. big, it's a biggie. Isn't it? It's the a biggie. But yeah, absolutely. It's big... in the name, <laughs> drum and bass. Right. So within the bass, we have. Uh, shall I? Yeah. Yeah. Fine. It's. The same sort of thing. It's simple. So this tune comes down to there's probably six synths, synth bases in there, but um, there's probably two that are doing the doing the hard work. You basically got the stab at the start, the super high impact, and then you got a, a kind of wobbly some yeah. LFO wobbly bass we've flattened a lot of our bases in here because serum is um hurting at the same time as doing the screen record but um we've left the kind of ones we want to talk about unfrozen so or flattened whatever um basically yeah so th i think these are n probably i think we got one massive and mostly serum love serum everybody does um Shall we have a real quick look? Yeah, let's at... let's jump into let's jump into the stabs first if you've got them. All right. Um, so I mean, you can see it's a serum. We love trash, multi-band distortion. Uh, isotope again, isn't it? It's just a multi-band distortion is so good because you don't have to like uh, copy the sound source to multiple tracks, or you you don't have to split the frequencies and then in order to not make it really messy because with distortion you generally want to apply it to you kind of want to avoid your lows basically mm, don't you mm. and you can do that within the plugin so multi-band distortion some ott uh and then that's basically it it's there's not a lot to it inside the plugin um it's a different story <laughs> <laughs> uh inside the plugin super simple one oscillator doing the the, the sound 
Uh, you have got some other sources. You've got another oscillator, but it's a sub oscillator. It doesn't I, count. I think it's, well, th th it's important to say sometimes with the sub, uh, we'll get to the sub in, you know, later on, but it is important to say that uh, Serum is amazing in the way that it gives you a direct uh, option yeah. for your sub. So, you know, you can obviously change the, you know, if you wanted to have more of a square wave or you want to have a sine wave or whatever it might be, that's great. But to have the option to have it directly out, because some, sometimes it's quite hard to get the level of sub uh, out of your, your main synth. If it's quite a... Uh, Especially when you're doing all this processing. Yeah, isn't it? And exactly. It, and it messes everything up. Like Matt says, you, you select direct out and it's not affecting it. You've got clean sine wave doing mm. the fundamental frequency of the bass you're working on. Yeah. Beauty. Super important because like, you know, if you start copying things and start, you know, trying to split them up, sometimes it gets real messy real quick and you don't want to start having problems that weren't really a problem in the first place. You just want to have that clean sub, uh, you know, hitting where it should be hitting. Quite um, often we'll do this uh, to everything that is going through the rest of the synth. Add an EQ at the end, roll off the low end, the super low, and then that way you don't get any phasing or any weirdness between what the synth is doing and the sub oscillator. You just got a clean sine wave taking care of the lows we ain't done it on this occasion because obviously for some reason we didn't need it maybe because this rectifier is doing most of that i don't know yeah um but yeah it's got a load of um it's got like a big uh envelope on the pitch on isn't the it? I pitch think yeah. that gives it that kind of high impact you really feel it it sweeps from super high uh down to quite a low this um, uh, wave table. Reese wavetable that's built into, I think, their digital wavetables is really sick. Always sounds good. We got a bit of spread on it. We got a bit of... Uh, this filter's nice because it does a band and a notch. Um, I think you do the notch there. This knob becomes the cutoff for that. And then the cutoff does the band pass. So I've probably completely destroyed the sound by doing that. But that's <laughs> what it comes down to. And then a little bit of uh, white noise or... Alpha noise. Alpha noise, yeah. Um, Should we play the sound on its own just so they can get an idea on the vibe? Yeah. If it's... Uh, so... Not, yeah, so it's real, real short. It's just uh, hitting on that first... Uh, that first sort of kick, every time, you know, and every time it's, 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 it's a... It's a high-impact sound, basically. Yeah, it's the, it's the character of the drop. This is everything. We could take the other sounds away and just have a sub or something because this sound is is punching you when the tune drops and, yeah. and it has a little rhythm to it very very simple 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 patch yeah um and what we've done here is to avoid getting all confused in the future with loads of automation uh ignore that this channel has been frozen and flattened it's identical to the one above it in that it's a midi channel with the same plugins and the same patch on the synth all it is is We've edited the patch a tiny bit so that it changes as the track goes on. You've got like a call and response kind of thing over every eight bars. And um, uh, it, it just keeps things moving. So this one, it goes... Uh, and then this one sounds like this. And all we do is we, we copy and paste, uh, control D or Apple D, uh, duplicate that channel, move, move the, the MIDI so that they don't play at the same time, and then we can edit it. That way, we know wherever this channel is pasted, um, it's going to sound like that, and wherever this one is, we don't mess up and go, oh, we forgot to paste the automation or whatever. It's basically a way of... It takes up a bit more CPU, but um, I don't know. It's keep, simple little keep, technique. Keeps your brain free, doesn't yeah, it, really? Yeah, Those yeah. kind of things can, can be confusing, you know, at yeah. times. And so we like to keep it as simple as possible, in our minds anyway. We do that all over the place. So with the other main bass sound in this track, the simple little wobble, you can see we've done the exact same thing again. Um, apart from on this one, we've got a, another one which is doing the sub outside of Serum for some reason. Um, that's just a sine wave I again. think that's just because of the sound source so again mm -hmm. you know in some instances it might work to take a direct out of serum like we were talking about a minute ago other times the, the sub just isn't isn't kind of cutting it in a certain way so you try 
Uh, you try different things. You try just using an external sub. Maybe that might be just a sine wave from whatever synth you might want to use. But you've got to keep trying these things to get the best out of the tune. It, it certainly happens when we get into the mix down stage. We'll, we won't be afraid to try and replace something because we spent hours on a synth. If the sub isn't cutting it, we're, we'll just jump straight in and try and replace it with something that is going to cut. Yeah, yeah. And it creates consistency. So we've, again, ignored that this has been flattened and converted to audio. These are the two, two of the same, exact same channels. All we've done is edited the patch on Serum. So maybe when we do that, sometimes the low end will come out more or less. And to, to create consistency, we've got yeah. one sub that's the same all the way through. And then we, um, we cut these. Uh, so on, uh, I mean, essentially this sound, I'll play it, is, this, again, it's nothing, it don't exactly reinvent the wheel, wheel. It's a distorted, dirty, little wobbly thing. Um, it's essentially three frequency. Uh, it's been split three times. So mm. it, it, on the on the patch, on the serum side, we've created a, an effects rack. Um, and then we've made two chains. Uh, am I on the right channel? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. We've made two chains. One gets heavily distorted, uh, ends up being uh, low cut at, at the end because we liked the way the distortion reacted to the low frequencies. So we didn't want to do this, the, take the low frequencies away at this point. We want to do it at the end of the chain. Um, otherwise, it sounds completely different because the distortion isn't reacting to that. But then we want to remove all those nasty muddy low frequencies that we've created with all the distortion yeah. and then we've got a clean channel okay it's got some ott i don't know why sometimes we don't play by the rules <laughs> <laughs> uh but um other than that it's clean and it's just been uh you know high cut down to 100 so we've got our crossover point and at the end of the day we have a nice um clean low and dirty high and then further down the chain, when the two sounds become one. Uh, They've been cut further a bit more, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, so. we cut the very, very low because then we've got a sine wave taking care of the low end. Um, boom. Then you get the three sounds working together um, with sort of very little clash of frequencies. They're mm. the two main sounds. Uh, I don't know the, if the, you want to talk about anything overall. The, the, well, the other sound that's on the turnaround is this Reese. Yeah. So we actually reused this from a, uh, a track that we did last year, which was called Rave Culture. And Arise was a big part of that tune. Um, so it's a sound that we had tweaked quite a lot uh, when, when we were writing that tune. But we thought uh, this track needed something on the turnarounds. Uh, and this was just one of the first sounds that we sort of just grabbed and it, it, it fit straight away. So we were happy with it. But there's a couple of things that... Are there's a couple of things that are interesting about that sound is that, again, we've used no, I mean, there's a couple of, there's like a sausage fattener on there. Mm. Um, that's just, again, giving it a bit of weight, just an extra bit of level. But really, we're using these uh, two um, Ableton pedal effects, the stock plugins. Again, they're really, really cool distortions. They've got three different... Um, Three different parts. You've got an overdrive, a distortion, and a fuzz. Um, and we've just, through combination of playing around with the wet dry or the, you know, the actual amount of gain that you're going to put into it, we've just found over a pretty basic, massive patch. Again, these aren't like, uh, like you know, reinventing the wheel. I hate to keep saying that, but they're they're really simple patches. Um, you know, it's just going to be like a couple of sawtooths that have you know been spread or whatever it might be. And then the distortion's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. The only other thing that's really cool about this sound is that we went pretty heavy on the mid side processing. So in the EQ itself, uh, there's a stereo uh, sort of thing going on with the, with, the, with the sides. There's a really big high lift from everything kind of 1K upwards. There's a bit of a dip just below that. So sort of the five, 600 area. Um, Again, keeping the mono sound really central, I guess, and just kind of like the weight of it. But then the sparkle and the kind of extra, uh, the grit that kind of grabs you is coming from the side. So mm. it's just a really super wide sound. Um, and then, yeah, a couple of extra bits, a little bit of delay, uh, which again is probably automated throughout the track and some compression against the vocal uh, to duck it. 
at a certain point. So for that instance, we, again, we don't we're not massive fans of sidechain, uh, but when the the sort of the right occasion pops up, and in this case, we wanted it to kind of have a natural duck out. We didn't want to do something really extreme or use any kind of vol volume automation to make it seem really obvious. We wanted it to have just a little bit of ducking against his vocal. So on the turnarounds, it kind of fit together and glued nicely. That was that was really all it was for. There's two things I just want to touch on that you already said. I think, first of all, there is a general rule. Most people know it. Uh, you usually want to keep your lowest frequencies mono. Uh, it all comes from kind of a history of playing on big systems in clubs and, and vinyl cutting as well. Exactly. Like, yeah, so, uh, so um, and so then your mids, your high mids, and your and your highs, you can go crazy. So, like Matt says, this sound is the you know he's kept the mono content down low, but he's really pushed the sides up high. And the other thing I wanted to say that you already made the point of about it's quite a basic patch on the synth. It's a basic Reese. It's like detuned saws. But uh, the magic happens when you apply dis the distortion, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And um, on that point, I just wanted to say my personal feeling is distortion's an amazing sound design tool. It's, it's the one. But the, a nice rule to kind of bear in mind, break the rules... Don't play by the rules, but as a rule to break. <laughs> uh, if you're going to play a lot with distortion, make your source as simple as possible. So generally speaking, really basic synth patches react really well to distortion. If you've got a really complex sound to start with, it's going to get messy quick because of all the harmonics you add using distortion. Mm. Uh, so if you're not doing too much outside the box or outside the synth, by all means, make, use really complex wavetables, loads of modulation, all of that stuff. Um, but you won't—you probably won't want to process it with something like this uh, really heavy distortion that adds loads of harmonics um, so much. But when you've got simple sound sources, simple patches, a, a nice, you know, low-pass square wave or something, that's when the magic happens and you can apply the distortion and happy accidents happen. And I mean, distortion's happy accident central. So that's all I wanted to say, I think. Yeah, I think it's important because, you know, a lot of our patches, um, you know, I can't speak for other people, but a lot of our patches will be, uh, even if it's within the synth, the distortion, like if we're using Serum, for example, the patch will be pretty, like, boring. Yeah. You know, it's going to be made up of, like, really f sort of, you know, normal sound, like, you know, like square waves and things like that. And um, and then all the crazy stuff comes from the distortion or little bits that we might process, um, you know, differently. So mm. it's something to remember, like Joe said, if you if you overcomplicate it at the early stages, you, it, it's hard sometimes to find a way of it cutting through if you're going to try and get that extra grit outside of the synth. If you're going to keep it within, you can always count on it being, you know, making more of an impact or more of a statement from having a simpler patch. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and then on on the the bass bus or the bass group, uh, not much going on. We've uh, chopped the super super lows below the sub, so that some of that rumble's gone. If there is any, probably don't need to do that. Um, Matty's ducked the five k region. It's looking like yeah. Yeah, the super sort of uh, harsh that stuff. Hurts. Isn't it? Yeah. Make it sparkle instead of hurting. A little bit of compression. Levels it out a little bit. Laziness just didn't mix down our bases well enough. <laughs> uh, a utility just doing volume automation, probably making them a bit quiet. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and then usually, usually we use the the kind of fading up in the intro. Yeah, kind of so we kind of duck certain elements just a little bit. Maybe that might be like a couple of dB or something like that, just before the drop, and also in the breakdown, just to give that extra weight. So when it does come around, uh, the tune's hitting at maximum loudness, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we, that's kind of a tip that we've done for, for a long time. Totally. And then uh, our side chain. Um, so not very much going on the groups. Uh, with basses, especially with all things, we kind of do most of the EQ in and most of the clinical stuff within the individual tracks because they're all so different. 
they behave differently, don't they? Mm. Harmonically, that you need to kind of EQ them, get them out the way of the kick and snare, do that mixing stuff at that stage early on and make sure everything slots together before you're anywhere near. Like the mixing stage is an old school way of thinking about it to us. Like we're mixing as we go. So um, when you look at the overall tracks, there's not huge, just a little tweak here and there to get them fitting together. Um, so you're going to chase your tail a lot if you if you start trying to if think don't that, work it right at the beginning yeah if you're yeah. if you're making a sound and you're sort of thinking i'll fix that in you know uh, later down the line you're going to spend a lot more time messing around you know you've got to get that sounding good that you know to use an example like your bass and your, your kick and snare it's like you've got to get that relationship working from the get-go mm -hmm. um you know there are things obviously that you can tweak and that you'll notice when you get way further down the line there'll be certain things and we, we will polish uh, the track a little bit on the master we might find that the track needs a little bit of eq and we'll find certain things that annoy us or mm -hmm. certain things that we want to enhance or whatever or a bit of widening here and there things like that but overall like like joe said you want to keep it um you want to keep it simple and you want to get it right from the get-go because it's really important mm. exactly um you can't polish a turd can yeah you? No. you can you can sprinkle glitter on it um, but you certainly can't polish that turd. Can't, you can't polish that no uh usually last point so basically that's it that's our track that's what it sounds like that's what it is um it's not rocket science but it's a drum and bass tune isn't mm. it? it's not supposed to be it's supposed to be fun and you're supposed to dance to it um the last point i was going to say usually we have an analyzer uh maybe one doing the frequencies also one doing the rms levels the average loudness levels after our limiter and it doesn't key map to the bypass when we solo our reference. And that for that, the purpose of that is so that we can measure the track we're referring to or multiple tracks and have a look at them post mastering and mix down and compare it to ours, which is sort of roughly post master because we've just hit it with a limiter pretty hard. And usually we... Um, we kind of mix into a limiter and we usually have a few different things on the bus. I think we've probably simplified this for the sake of this video because we know that the computer uh, is moaning a little bit about doing the screen record. So everything's a bit, we've deleted a few things. But um, yeah, that's the only other thing I wanted to say. Other than that. That's pretty much it. That's a drum and bass tune. Yeah. So uh, we've been Document One and this is us signing off on our new track, which is called Hands Up on Elevate Records. So yeah. Thanks to Future Music and uh, peace. Woo!